Now, grace and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery, with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm. Therefore, you shall have no other gods. That's the great law given to Moses and the people at Mount Sinai when they're in the desert uh, in the midst of their 40-year journey. And we all know that the reason it took them 40 years is that Moses being a guy who would not stop and ask for directions. No, the reason that it takes them 40 years is when they're shortly on the journey, they send spies into the Promised Land, 12 people, and when they come back, Ten of them say, those people are giants. We have no chance to defeat them. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, we can take these folks. Let's go on and get started. Those are the only two that actually get to make it to the promised land out of all the people that had left Egypt. By the time they get to Egypt, that first generation of escapees have all passed along in the journey. That's what God says, because you would not act. I'm going to make it take 40 years and I'm going to bury all you folks on the way. There's something very important that goes on here in the giving of this law. And we all know, yeah, we've got the Ten Commandments and all like that. But there, there's a motif that starts here that recurs throughout the Bible. And uh, we're going to have to have a, you know, when I was a kid, we just took English, but now I understand it's English, E-L-A, I don't know what that means. Some kind of arts. But we're going to talk about the difference between the indicative and the imperative. And all the other, you might not saw all go a bunch of eyes just get glanced over as soon as I said that. <laughs> but it's very important. Now, in case you have been so long since you were in school, indicative means you point something out, you know. You know, that book is read. That's an indicative sentence. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land, out of the hand of slavery, with a mighty arm and an outstretched hand. That's an indicative sentence. And then we jump into the imperative. Imperative is a command. You shall have no other gods. And right away we want to understand. That when God gives a command like that, and he doesn't give all that many imperative commands in the Old Testament, not near as many as we think, but when he does, it's always based in that, in that indicative sentence, this is what I've done for you, that's, therefore I'm going to give you this command. God's commands are always based in God's activities. God does stuff for us, then God says, this is how you live now that I've done this for you. And that's what the Ten Commandments are. I used to, to a long time ago, because I've been doing this a while, I used to talk about this, that these were ten Burma Shave signs, and then I found out that most people don't know what a Burma Shave sign is. But when I was a kid, all those many years ago, back, you know, when the sun wasn't quite full shining like it is now, uh, when you drove down the road somewhere, and it wasn't on an interstate, because they hadn't been built yet, Burma Shave, which was a popular shave cream for men, would have little signs with sayings on them stretched out along the road, and as you went along, you would reach in, and then at the end of it, it would be shaved with Burma Shave. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. But it helps to understand that even though these laws are imperatives that we're to do them, it's for our own best interest. <laughs> It's in our best interest to remember who God is. You know, some, I, I saw something on the internet, and I don't often look at stuff like this, and I mostly don't ever uh, talk about it, but th this was so clever, I just have to tell you, it says, you know you have created God in your own image when God hates everything you hate. Now that's clever. It's probably unfortunately true. But God is making a claim on us as God's people. 
and he's saying there's a way to live as my people. I'm your only God. I'm your only God. Everything else is your God. And it goes into all this stuff about idols and things like that. And then, you know, and we understand, you know, the people of Israel live in and among all these other peoples, and they all had idols. And they all assumed that that idol that was God, and they prayed to that idol. And sometimes I can tell you they were the most grotesque looking things you could ever imagine to put together. And God says, you're not going to do that. You're going to worship me. And you don't need a picture or a statue to look at when you do it. You're going to keep the Sabbath day holy. Makes good sense. Everybody needs a day off sometimes. I can remember one time, this was a long time ago, um, I worked out at the nuclear plant when it was under construction, and I worked from the first of June to the last day of August. I worked every day. I didn't have a day off. Now, I didn't work eight hours or ten. You know, our normal day was ten hours. I would work sometimes, you know, just four or five hours on a Saturday or Sunday, but I still worked, and I tell you what, by the end of the summer, I was exhausted. I was, because I was getting up every morning and going in, and a lot of times, I was just there in case off. Not because there was necessarily anything to do, but in case somebody needed something, I worked in the warehouse department. If somebody needed some kind of piece of equipment issued, I had to be there to issue it. Made a lot of money, but I was tired. And this is one of my favorite ones. Remember, um, honor your mother and father. And then it, it's, it's the only one that has a codicil. It says, so you may live long in the land that I'm giving you. Because it's saying, if you can't do this, bad things are going to happen. And we need to remember that. It says, don't commit murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie. Well, how much easier would life be for everybody on the planet Earth if we lived by those? Don't covet. Now, covet's always the hardest one to explain to people. What does it mean to covet? Well, it doesn't mean that if you go to school or to work one day and you see somebody wearing a shirt and you like that shirt, you say, I'm going to go out to the store and buy me one just like it. That's not what coveting is. Coveting is when you go and you look and you see that shirt or whatever else somebody has and you really like it and you find some kind of dirty, underhanded, wicked way to work it, to get them to give it to you instead of letting them keep it. That's coveting. It involves, this is a great word, skullduggery. Ten Commandments are given to us the commandments, and we're supposed to do them. But they're there to make life easier and better and happier and fuller, not to restrict us or be mean to us or something like that. They're given to us so that we can have a good, happy, full life. And we need to rejoice in it because they're a mark of how much God loves us. Now, most of you, we don't think of commandments as that, you know, it's like, you know, when we're growing up, we get those, you will do the dishes tonight. You don't think that's necessarily anything good for us, except it means we don't have to eat off dirty dishes for breakfast, maybe. Or you must clean your room, boy. I never liked that one. I've never met a kid who did. But we all live with those. And if we learn to keep our rooms at least sort of neat, makes life a little easier on us. Jesus goes into the temple one day. Now understand that, you know, the temple's a big place. You know, you could put, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine of these churches inside. It was big. It had 
blocks of stone that were longer than this flyer thing is and probably up to the rafters and three or four feet across. Ton, way tons. Just one block of stone. It was made out of whole big blocks of stone like that. It was a huge building. And truthfully, there had always been some business being done. Now sometimes there was also some skullduggery in that business. In the court of the Gentiles, which is where this event would have taken place if we read for Jesus today, there would have been a certain part of that where you went in if you needed to buy an animal for sacrifice, that you could buy that. Or if you needed to something else in that line, you could do that. But this, but you know, what happened sometimes is that you had an animal and you brought it and the priest would examine it and say, no, this animal isn't good enough to be sacrificed to God. You're going to have to get one of those from the pre-approved stack. And then you would go to pay for it. Well, no, that money isn't right. You've got to have a temple shekel, not a, not a Greek denarius. So you've got to go over there and change your denarius into shekels, where you might get shortchanged just a little bit. And then three guys later might buy that lamb that you had brought that didn't make the cut. This is part of what's going on there. Not only was it a marketplace, but always an honest marketplace. And Jesus goes in and sees all of this being done, and nobody is paying attention to what they're supposed to be there for, which is to be involved in the worship of God. And there's so much stuff going on that even the Gentiles, now, you know, Gentile means anybody that's not a Jew. That'd be us. Or anybody else. Now, most often in the New Testament, you'll hear the word Greek, but Greek simply means somebody that's not us. I mean, there were a lot of Greeks around, but everybody who wasn't us was also called a Greek because everybody in that part of the world spoke a little bit of Greek and that's how you got along. You know, that was sort of the language everybody could speak some of so that you could do business because not everybody spoke everybody else's language. And boy, there was a whole slew of languages around there. And so the court of the Gentiles was for those people who weren't Jews, but who followed Jewish custom and law and worshipped the Jewish, the Jewish God, Yahweh, so that they too could be there, but it was the furthest part away from the altar where the act of worship was being had. And Jesus is going there, and they've got these people who are there to worship, and they can't even figure out what's going on because the marketplace is so rowdy, so noisy, that it interferes with that. And that's when Jesus takes a bunch of cords and ties them together in a kind of a whip and starts running everybody and everything out. And he says, you made it. You know, you turn this into a marketplace and not a house of God. And it needs to be a house of God. And probably if you ask Jesus, well, how are we going to get all this business done? It has to be done. It has to be done. You know, people have got to be able to get sacrifices. they got to pay their temple dues or whatever it is. You know, and Jesus would have said, why don't you set up a tent outside? Take care of all that there, but leave inside the temple something that belongs to God. And in our lives, we need that too. We need an understanding that this may be our temple. This is the place where we do worship. This is the place where we come to be in communion with one another and in communion with God and Jesus. But that we need to be filled in such a way that when we walk out, we carry it with us. God cares for us. He gives us the law as a, not so much to be, um, you know, hard on us, but to be good to us, to make life easier and happier and so that when we come and we're here to be in a place of worship, we can actually 
do that worship without being distracted at what's going on. And we can live with those laws and we can live in this place and take all of that back outside and share it with the world. Which is what God wants us to do in the first place. God never means for us to hide our faith. Now that doesn't mean you run out and find the first convenient street corner and hold up a Bible and start telling everybody they're going to heck in a handbasket if they don't agree with you. Although I have seen that all my life. But it does mean that we have genuine care and concern for the people of the world, for our neighbors, be they close, be they far. Because as God says, all the people on planet Earth, those are my people. And somebody says, who does God choose? God says, I choose everybody. God doesn't, God doesn't have it back. You know, when you run your hands up inside, you get to choose first for a team. God chooses everybody to be on his team. We have these rules, these laws, these commandments to make life easier for us so that then we can worship in truth and take what we get in worship back outside of us and bless the world.